So after after uh, Muli here gave the high level view of the Sertora prover and tools, and uh, what is the idea of the whole thing? Uh, our next step is to do something more uh, technical to dive into how actually working with Sertora looks like, and uh, we would like to explain you how to how to define these properties of the code, how to give them how to feed them to the prover. And uh, hopefully you'll have the chance to actually uh, use the tool and write rules of your own. So like I mentioned before, the, part, the practical part will require Docker desktop and downloading our Docker image, which might be a bit slow with, uh, with, the, with the Wi-Fi because many people are here, but we'll see, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll manage it. So how will the workshop look like? Uh, first, we will talk about the Sertora approval technology, which is uh, Muli already discussed it at length. From the from the high level uh, high level uh, point of view, then we will talk about uh, we will give some introduction to the CVL, where CVL is the Sertora verification language. is It's the rules that uh, we it's the custom language that we use to define uh, properties to define uh, rules of uh, how the code should behave. And then we will dive deep after the introduction to CVL. We will dive deeper into into some CVL features like parametric rules and invariants. Don't worry if you don't understand these uh, terms, we will explain everything in detail. And after we finish uh, explaining all the CVL and the features, we, we will uh, move to the exercise. Maybe we will have a short break and uh, have to install some uh, the Docker image for the exercise. So the exercise will be you will try to, we, we provide the ERC20 token code Box and you write simple rules and uh, basically find this bug. And the idea, is that, the idea is that you can get a feel, get a taste of how it is to do formal verification, which is pretty uh, interesting. All right, so let's start. Uh, this example, I think Muli discussed it, how, what, what the Sertora approval do, so I will not uh, talk a lot about it. Here is the good code, so we will gi we give the correct code and the invariant total supply equals to the sum of all balances. We give both of them to the prover, and the prover says, fine, the property, the invariant always holds. And uh, when we give the buggy code to the prover, and with the same invariant, the prover will find a counterexample, which is a self-transfer, like somebody mentioned here. Uh, so when from equal, is it equals to two, then the property doesn't hold because kind of new, new tokens are being minted out of thin air. So everybody understand this part. So now let's uh, give a high level view of Sertora Prover architecture, how, how the whole process works. So uh, like, uh, we, like we see, uh, first of all, we take the smart contract code and the rules, the specification, how the code should work. So there is some kind of transformation of the smart contract code. We will not discuss that in detail. And the eventually the smart contract code and the rules, they both are combined by the Sertora prover into a VC. And VC here is not the venture capital. It's a verification condition. It's a big uh, logical formula that uh, combines both the, smart, both the code and the, and, the, and the rules. And this uh, huge logical formula is being fed into the into several open source constraint solvers. Now the job of these constraint solvers is to find the variables which do, do, not, uh, do not satisfy the, the logical formula. So when uh, uh, this set of variables that doesn't satisfy the formula is found, then it's the counterexample. Then, then it means that the rules don't, are not, don't uh, describe the code properly. So it means either there is a bug in the code or the rules are not written properly. And if the constraint solvers don't manage to find any variables that violate the formula, then it means that uh, the formula is correct and it means the rules are correct. That means that the rules describe the code correctly and, and we call that we prove the correctness of the code. So this is the big, big scheme how the, um, how the Sertura prover is built. Okay, so after all this uh, abstract uh, uh, abstract um, diagrams, let's uh, dive in and start to talk about uh, CVL. How, how, how we actually, we, how, we, how, we do, how we write this part. 
So our idea in, in this workshop, we work with the RC20 code, which is uh, probably the most uh, common smart contract in existence. Uh, and we want to start by proving that the transfer function works as expected. Right, so uh, this is this is CVL. This is for most of you probably is for, for your first view of the CVL. And CVL is uh, very similar to Solidity. It's it's been um, it's been designed to, to 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 resemble Solidity, so that the Solidity developers will find it easy to work with. And uh, this keyword rule is it is like, like it like it says it describes one property about the code. So what do we want to express? What do we want to express? We want to express that the um, it transfer uh, functions properly, that after the transfer is called on the, on the token, then the sender's balance is reduced by amount and the recipient's balance is increased by amount. So this is the basic uh, structure of the CVL rule. First we do some operation and then we describe the assertion. We describe, we assert something, we describe what, what, should, be, what should the state be after the operation has been uh, executed or performed. So here we, here we see there is all these variables, but uh, you know, we, I guess we're all developers here, so we cannot use variables without uh, defining them or declaring them somewhere. So let's see how we, how we declare these variables. So my balance will be balance of message sender, which makes sense. Message sender sends the tokens. And recipient balance is the balance of the recipient. Then we call we call the we call the transfer, and we we check the balances again. My balance after the operation, recipient balance after the operation, and we do the assertion, right? So if these assertions are true, then it means we've proved the correctness of the transfer function. We prove at least that the balances are increased and balances are handled correctly. Uh, maybe, maybe you can see something, some, def some definition is missing in the code, right? Anybody can uh, see which variable is uh, just is mentioned but is never declared. Um, uh, yeah, the contract also and the some, small, some uh, local variables, we, we see the recipient and the amount, they're not they just mentioned here, but actually the the compiler would not know what what is these variables. So let's let's handle that. Let's 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 pass this recipient and the amount as parameters to the rule. So basically, the rule is similar to a function syntactically, and we can we can pass any any parameters to this rule. So now, when we use the recipient and the amount in 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 the call to to smart contracts transfer. Uh, the compiler knows what it is, it is parameter to the, to the rule. And the, the way Sertura Prover works, you can think about it as if Sertura Prover will try all the possible combination of these parameters, all the possible amounts, all the possible recipients. Of course, it's impossible to actually try all the possible amounts, it will take a long time, but because we use uh, logical formulas, then we can think about it as if trying all the possible uh, values here. Uh, but there is still another thing which is not uh, which we, we, we didn't declare, and this is the message sender. So what is this message sender? How, I mean, we all know message sender from Solidity, but in CVL it's just a little bit different. Uh, well, before we talk about that, we should mention that these variables like recipient and, and amount, they can also be declared inside the function, inside the rule, and it's uh, identical syntax, just uh, different syntaxes to, to express the same si thing, just to tell the uh, declare these variables for the compiler. So we see we can pass this, we can pass it as parameters to the rule, we can declare them inside the rule, we can pass something as a parameter and declare some another variables inside the rule, it's all the same, doesn't matter. So now let's talk about uh, message sender, yeah? So the actual syntax uh, in CVL. So in CVL to refer to the environment variables, we use a, we use a data type called the ENV, a struct. And this struct contains all these uh, built-in, uh, all these variables that are built-in in Solidity. So in Solidity you can, you can use msg.sender, msg.value, block number, etc. 
in a CVL because it's not solidity, it's not a it's different different execution model. So we use uh, this env struct and we, we can refer to a message sender, message value and block number and the others uh, as fields of E of this uh, env struct. So env is the data type and E is the instance. Right, so, so to take the message sender balance, we just say balance of e.msg.sender. We just have to make sure that the E is uh, declared. So the compiler knows what we refer to. And another thing, uh, another thing where we, another um, uh, important way we use the environment, we have to pass it to the to some uh, smart contract uh, functions. Yeah, so when we call transfer, we need to give it the environment as well. Yeah, because the transfer is a, is, a, uh, is depends on what is the message sender value, what is the message, uh, what is the MSG value, what is the MSG sender. So we need to give the environment. And then uh, what happens is the prover uh, tries the transfers with all, all different environments, different message sender. It, it will try everything. Uh, so, this, so, now, so now our rule is complete, but there is still something is missing. What is missing is the declaration of this smart contract calls. Yeah, so we know that ERC20 includes balance of. We know that ERC20 includes transfer, but we also need to, de to declare them for the CVL compiler, right? So how do we do that? We use a methods block. So here is an example of a small methods block. And in this methods block, we have a declaration of a balance of. Now you will see some uh, keywords that you're not familiar with from Solidity, which is env free. What does it mean? env free means that uh, we declare functions that don't use the environment. That they don't care about a message sender, don't care about message value. Usually it's gonna be view functions. Yeah, like here we have balance of, we have allowance. This, these are view functions, they don't uh, change anything, they don't care about the environment. So we declare we declared them in uh, methods block as env free. And it means that we, when we invoke these functions, when we call these functions from the rule, we don't need to pass the environment to these functions. That's why you can see here that when we call balance of, we don't send the environment. We just send this parameter, with the address, the you know, MSG sender at the end of the day, it's an address. But when we call the transfer, we need to pass the environment on top of the, um, the usual transfer parameters, which we all know, which is the recipient and the amount. Okay, so now we wrote the message block, now we have the message block, now we have the rule. And uh, let's see what happens when we actually execute this rule with the Sertora approver. This is the output, this is the output of the tool. So when we run the, when we run the rules, it gives, it, it gives you a web page, which is dynamically updated with the execution results. And uh, we, see he, we see on the left side, the, the name of our rule was uh, trans, uh, transfer. Here it's, it's called transfer spec, it should be transfer. Uh, and we see that the rule failed. Yeah, we see this uh, scary, red, scary red icon. So what could, be, what could be the problem in this rule? Can anybody say why is this rule, uh, why is this rule uh, incorrect? Why is there a counterexample? Self-transfer. Uh, yeah, there is a problem here with uh, with uh, self-transfer. Yeah, because yeah, we, we, let's, let, there is a problem with self-transfer. But let's see how Sertora approver helps us understand the problem, helps us understand the counterexample. So if you look at the local, so when it shows as a counterexample, it shows what 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 is the what is the state of the local variables in this counterexample. So if you see if you see here, we look at the recipient and we look at the message sender, we see they are uh, one and the same. Yeah, it's uh, 0x401. So it, it kind of gives us a hint that the problem here is with self-transfer, right? And if, if you zoom in on the local variables, yeah, it's, we, we see the same thing. So the problem is, yes, yeah, that, that if we send the token to ourselves, 
the assertion says my balance after should be my balance before minus the amount. But obviously, if you send the token to ourselves, my, the balance stays the same, and this assertion is, is incorrect. So this is how the Sertora prover shows as a counterexample. In this situation, of course, uh, the problem is not with the smart contract code, the problem is with the rule. It's just uh, not written correctly, it doesn't take uh, the self-transfer scenario into account. So well, uh, how do we handle that? It's a very common, very common scenario. Uh, because a rule is mostly correct, there's just one, one, one situation where it's not correct. So uh, what we do, we add the require. We say, uh, let's only look at the scenarios where the message sender is not equal to recipient. Let's ignore completely the scenario where message sender is equal to the recipient because it's not interesting for us. And for this, we use the require, require uh, keyword, which basically kind of a precondition. Yeah, so here we have a precondition, here we have the operation, and here we have the post condition. And when we, when, we run, when we run the rule with this requirement, it will, it will succeed because now it's correct. So this is, this, uh, for most of you, it's, it's the first, uh, first introduction to CVL. This is how uh, rules lo look like. This is how we write the rules. We went over rule declaration, variable definition, methods block, and what is the env variable. So this is basic intro to CVL. Uh, congratulations, now you, you can, You've already seen CVL and know the, the basis of it. Now let's do something a little bit more uh, complicated. Now let's move to another rule where uh, we want to say that whenever transfer is called, the recipient's balance always increases. Yeah? So we, 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 uh, what we do is we take the balance before, balance, uh, balance of the recipient, then we transfer to some tokens to the recipient, some amount of tokens. Then we take the balance again, and then our, our assertion is that the balance after should be greater than balance before. So I guess most of you already see the, what can be problematic with this rule. Yeah? When the amount is equal to zero, then this, uh, this inequality will not hold, yeah? because the balance after will be, will be, will be equal to balance before. So. What do we do about that? Like we mentioned before, we, we can add a require. Yeah, so we can, we just require the assumption. We can, we can say, okay, let's require that the amount should be greater to zero. And then uh, the Sertora prover will ignore the scenarios where amount is equal to zero. We'll, we'll, not, we'll, not, we'll not look at these cases. Another thing we can do is use an if statement, which is a little bit clumsy, but it also works. So we say, if the amount is greater, to, greater than zero, then balance after, uh, we assert balance after is greater than balance before. If the amount is not greater than zero, then we don't care, we just return true. But there is a, but there is a more uh, elegant way in CVL to express this if statement, and uh, this way is to use an implication, which we use, uh, basically, it's, uh, it's quite common to use with CVL. Implication is a logical operation which is not, uh, is not present in solidity, but it's uh, very useful for assertions. So just a reminder, implication, this is the truth table of implication. Yes, yeah, so it's always uh, true, but only if uh, false predicate implies, uh, imp implies true predicate, then the whole implication is, uh, sorry, if the true predicate implies false predicate, then the whole implication is false. It's true in other cases. So this is the syntax for implication, and it's, it's, uh, it's short and it's elegant way to express this, ki this kind of uh, assertions. So we say if the amount, amount is zero, implies that the balance after is greater than balance before. I think uh, we all can agree that it's a more elegant syntax and more readable than using if statements, and it uh, simplifies, simplifies the rule because we don't need to use the requires at the beginning. So basically we, we, com we, use, we define oral logic in this uh, implication, right? But what happens when we run this? We will still get some error. And what is the error? Yeah, the self-transfers that we had before. When the recipient is equal to message sender. So how do we fix the error? Um, yeah, we can, now we already knew, know a few ways how to, how to 
how to fix this kind of error. So again, we can we can add the require that says recipient is not equal to message sender. We could also use an implication. Uh, it's not it's not it's not in the slide, but also implication could be added here. It just would make it a bit more uh, clunky. This assert in the end. So basically, implication is like an if statement where the else block contains assert true. And uh, just to summarize the ways to work with assumptions, either there is a require as a precondition or we use implication in the assert. Okay, so questions until now? Everything, everything, uh, everything seems clear? Awesome. So now let's move to another uh, syntax, another part of CVL uh, syntax, which is uh, revert. Yeah. So in general, in general, if we if we uh, use the, the syntax that we looked at until now, like precondition, operation, postcondition, the prover only looks at non-reverting path. So if uh, during the execution of smart contract it, it did the revert, then the prover completely ignores this execution path. It will only look at the paths where there was no revert. So in this example, this is a, counter, a bit counterintuitive. So let's, let's look at this function foo, which reverts if the parameter is 10. And now we, we, we write a CVL rule, which is supposed to test foo. So we, we, we invoke foo with, with, with 10, and we say assert false. So assert false, of course, means that the rule will will fail because we, you know, false is never we can never assert false and expect uh, true. But the, the rule will succeed. Why? Because all because uh, when we invoke foo with ten, it it always reverts. So so the assertor approval will always ignore this execution path, and it will never reach this line. It will never reach this line, and the rule will succeed. So this is a bit counterintuitive part, which uh, uh, important to remember. That it all... Uh, interesting question. How do we handle try and catch? If the if the revert is caught inside the solidity code, right? So, so then if we, then the internal revert is equal to 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 normal revert. And then it will be considered the reverting path. Right, so we'll, we, we see that the prover normally will consider non-reverting paths, but sometimes it's very important to, to, to consider reverting paths as well. So, of course, code, we, sometimes we have to verify, we have to prove that the code reverts correctly. Corrects when we expect it to, reverts when we expect it to revert, and doesn't revert when we don't expect it to revert. So how do we look at reverting paths as well? So CVL has a syntax for that. And the syntax is we invoke the function with this uh, little addition add with revert. So this uh, this 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 keyword uh, is a comma is tells is tells uh, the prover to consider all the passes, both reverting and non-reverting. And how do we know if this um, 
uh, uh, function call reverted or not. So we have this Boolean variable last reverted, which is another keyword in uh, CVL. And this Boolean variable just holds the result of the previous uh, function call. It's true if the previous function call reverted, it's false if the previous function call did not revert. So this is, this is an example of a rule that uses this syntax. So it says, user must not be able to transfer more tokens than they own. So what happens is, first we had a precondition that says the balance of the sender is uh, less than the amount, right? So of, obviously we cannot transfer more tokens than our balance, right? So this transfer should revert. And then we call transfer this Ill, in, invalid amount. And we, we expect, we assert that this call uh, reverted, yeah? That the last reversion is true. Again, because the amount is, is too large, because the amount is larger than our balance. Um, but uh, when, we, when we use reverse, there is a lot of uh, small nuances because uh, a function may revert for, for several reasons. We expect it to revert because uh, the amount is too large, but it may revert for many other different reasons. And um, it's important to remember when we work with reverting passes. Now we will look at different uh, scenarios where the function, where the simple function transfer reverse for many different reasons. So first of all, uh, first of all, uh, when we execute this rule, we will, uh, okay, so now, now we do it a little bit different rule. Now we say the balance is legitimate, right? And we transfer with revert, and we assert that the call did not revert, okay? Now the balance is greater than the amount, so we, we are allowed to transfer this amount. We, uh, but we, we say, okay, let's consider the reverting passes as well as non-reverting. And we assert that there was no revert, yeah, because it looks, looks good, yeah? We have, the, our balance is good enough, and we, transfer to, we try to transfer tokens. But we're still gonna get a lot of rewards, why? So the first revert will be because message value is zero, is not zero, sorry. Right, because message value means there was some ether value sent to this function to transfer, but the transfer is not payable, right? So it will revert because it doesn't know what to do with this ether sent to it. So normally, when we don't, we don't use this at with revert, the prover would ignore all these kind of scenarios. But when, it, when we explicitly tell it don't ignore reverting passes, it will, it will find us all the possible reverts, yeah? So because M MSG value is part of this variable uh, of E. And uh, like we mentioned before, Sertora approval will try all the possible combinations. It will, of course, it will try E with uh, all, all, diff all, all values of E, including where message value is uh, one, two, whatever, it's, it's greater than zero. So here it reverses because message value is not zero. Okay, so we fix that. We say require message value zero, and we expect it to work. But no, it will not work because it, now it will revert due to overflow, yeah? Because when the uh, recipient balance is too large, is almost uh, maximum, and when we try to, to send the recipient three tokens, now we get an overflow. And now because, let's assume that we use the new Solidity, newer Solidity versions, which checks overflow by default. So it will revert because it cannot, it cannot add three to this, uh, you know, max unit minus one. So it, re it reverts again. So now, okay, let's add this condition. Let's look, uh, let's add this precondition. Let's say, okay, balance of recipient plus amount should be less than max UIN. So we don't get overflow. But now we get a different revert. And what is the different revert? It says message sender is zero, right? Because most of the ERC20 tokens, they, they do not allow uh, transferring tokens from zero or to zero. And, uh, and Sertor approval is, go is going to try all the possible values of environments. So of course it will try the environment where the message sender is zero because we didn't explicitly tell it not to try. So now we have to add this condition, require message sender is not equal to zero, but we're still gonna get a revert because the recipient is zero. And only after we added all these uh, preconditions, now we can uh, uh, run the rule successfully. And what is the point of all this? The point of uh, this is to explain that when we work with reverting passes, usually there is many of them and sometimes there is more than we expect. So every time we have to look, why did we get this revert? 
Is it interesting to us? This, these cases are, are not so interesting, so we just have to add a precondition and filter them out. So there's a lot of uh, nuance, there's a lot of uh, work involved with uh, working with reverting passes. It's more complicated. Yeah? How long does it take to how long does it take to run a rule? It depends on the code complexity. So, for example, the simple ERC20 code uh, running a rule would take maybe 30 seconds or a minute. But uh, some when the code is very complex, it can take uh, it can take even an hour. It really depends, and uh, sometimes even if we can get a timeout, like the prover might not be able to to prove the formula if the code is complex enough, and then it's a very advanced topic how to make the code simpler, how maybe to split it into modules, maybe simplify some code. Yeah, it, it, happens, it happens often in uh, real time, re, re, real code, not the demo ERC20 token. Yeah. You mean the, the message? The, no, we don't have the message. But uh, we use this, uh, we use the trace, the call trace, and the variables to understand wh why it reverted. So the summary of with revert and last reverted. So basically, when we use at with revert, we tell the tool to get to the assert even when no, uh, when, when no non-reverting passes exist. Last reverted can be used to check situations. It should revert fairly easily. And checking all these live, liveness properties is less straightforward. Like we showed, we have to look at a lot of nuances and uh, add a lot of requires. It's common. So another, uh, um, another uh, how to say, check, uh, check spot. Uh, another, another, another. Um, we, we finished another part of the uh, of the explanation of CVL. So we went over transfer spec, check addition of transfer rules, transfer reverts, transfer does not revert. We already seen example of four rules. We look. We explained the ENV variable in more detail, and we explained with revert and last reverted. And uh, and now Sasha will explain uh, another another parts of CVL, um, another CVL features. Hi everyone, I'm Sasha. Also work at Sutora. Now I'll continue Euros talk about other features of the CVL. Uh, he explained to you like he showed you like the properties that we can verify over the transfer, but in ERC we know there are also many other things. For example, allowance, and uh, like how confident we are about allowance, that it's correctly, well, it's, it's ERC and we know that it's okay, but let's say you got a new token, you don't know what, what's going on there. We also need to check it. Then we start to write a simple rule. We start with uh, defining the rule. Then we usually prefer to start, it's like a good practice from the assertion, uh, where you express your formula. For example, here we want to say that if allowance was changed, then the message sender was the owner. And pretty simple, but also it can help you to understand what do you need for your rule. For example, we definitely need to call a proof because the property that we want to verify is for now, it's only on a proof. We define the necessary variables to call it and we made a call to approve itself. And uh, the only thing that left is allowance before, allowance after, simple call, simple rule. If we run it uh, in, uh, in our tool, we will get it as verified, but what does it mean in general? And now it's the time to talk about the coverage. Uh, it's like one, uh, one of the important property of our properties that we try to and to improve this part, to make the coverage more like if, if the contract is covered like 100% that we know it's like the perfect, it's not easy to reason about it, but we try to do our best. So according to that rule, uh, we can say, is it, does it increase the coverage? Is it well written? Is it passing? It might be objective, but we should do our best to improve the coverage. And what we can say about our coverage of allowance. The good thing that we proved that 
it's uh, like a proof is only called by the owner. That's good. But what about other functions? There are many other functions and uh, they can change allowance. One approach is like the most straightforward but the most tedious. You write specific rule for each function of our construct. Let's say you, you decided you don't want to check few functions because they don't change anything. There are still many like transfer, transfer from increase, decrease allowance. Might be tedious. And we have a better way, a simpler way to do it. Uh, we, in, we introduce a uh, notion of parametric rule. Uh, they don't ask if the owner called a specific function. Uh, instead, we ask if any function was called and what the outcome of that call. This is the rule we have. It's like very specific. We want more generalized and the question how we can do it. Uh, instead of proof, we want to call any possible function of a contract. In, for, this we, for this, we use method f. Method is a keyword. It means that instead of f, the tool will try uh, to use any public or external uh, functions of the contract. Uh, I want to state that only public and external. So if you have something uh, private or internal, you need to change the visibility or make uh, another function which calls it. Like you, you create a public function which calls your internal uh, function. Uh, then we need to define uh, the arguments of the function and they can be different. We, here you don't need to specify it because we have another keyword called data arg. It means that the tool automatically will uh, assume necessary arguments for each function. Like if it's like only one address as an argument or it's like you int an address, we don't care right now. The rest we simply copy from uh, the previous version of the rule where we did it only for approval only. And now let's try to run and see the magic happens. This uh, on the left side, you can see all the function that the, our tool tried to call. And we are the only one, but there is on one red dot that we don't really like because it's a violation. I mean, if it's a bug, it's good because we prevented it, but it also might be in feasible state. Here we see that it's like we transfer from and uh, it's legitimate, legitimate way to change the allowance as we know it. But let's try to understand what's the real reason of it. <coughs> uh, and uh, in our verification report, we can get a call trace. The call trace we get only for violations to see the scenario, we to understand in, we, in, in what way we could uh, to violate the property and to understand if it's the bug in, this, in the spec that we wrote or it's in the bug in the code. Here we see the arguments that we used for uh, transfer from. Uh, the sender is 401, the same as owner recipient is F. And also we want to check the e-message sender because this is what we use in our assertion. And as we can see here, it's another address, it's 426. Uh, that's why we've got the violation because the sender is stated in the transfer from the same as owner, but the message sender is not a donor right now. And what we can do about it, because we have a violation, but it's not a problem code. Uh, we can change our like property a bit and uh, the way to do it, that instead of saying that allowance is changing, we want to ensure that if allowance was increased, then uh, the, the message sender should be the owner. Uh, any questions at this point? Okay. Now if we run it, we see that it's passing. Mm, well, that's good, we checked something, but, and we increased allowance with the in, uh, allowance, but there are still some unverified parts about other functions, for example, how we can change allowance. Uh, one proposal that we have is to check if allowance was changed by, by specific functions. And for this uh, thing, we use another feature of CVL. It's called method selector. The most of the rule we take from the previous version, but we change the assertion a lot. Here we see if allowance before and after different. Then we check uh, using the selector f selector equal then the function signature dot selector and we know like for example we just we, we, we could read the code and see what changes it briefly like approve transfer from increase decrease allowance 
we check it. Uh, here we use, uh, we, we can use them in one block uh, with or. Uh, we, we cannot use and because like in any specific run, f can be only one method. So that's why we use the or. And if we run it, it will be verified. So we also, we again increase the coverage. Now we're more sure that there is no other way to, to, change, the allow, uh, to change allowance. We are more confident here. And uh, it's like, we, we, we covered like all like the main, the main things about the rules, how we get like there, but, but the rule is only one thing which we use uh, to explain our properties. There is another thing, uh, in, we call it invariant. It's a property of the contract state that is expected to be true uh, whenever a contract method is not currently executing. It's, as I said, it's like another way to write the properties, uh, like, but it's only applicable for several types of them. The types of the properties is not a part of this talk, but in general, uh, we can uh, talk about, we can reason about value states of a contract and high level properties. By high level properties, we usually mean uh, if we reason about external dependencies or not dependent on the implementation, on, on implementation, some properties they're not dependent. Like in ERC, uh, the total supply should be greater or equal than the balance of one user. Just like this simple example. Uh, like some benefits of an invariant, usually it's smaller in the size because yep, it's smaller in the size. It's one of the reasons why, why it's because it's really why it's really comfortable. It also covers a bit more than a rule because the rule doesn't cover the state after the constructor invariant can do it. Invariant we also can rewrite as a rule every invariant, but not every rule can be rewritten as an invariant. And one of the main disadvantages, if you want to check any specific scenario, for example, in a parametric rule, I showed you that we can call only method f, but you can define method f and method d and to see some other interesting outcomes of it. Uh, this is an example of the properties that I already defined, that, that the total supply is greater or equal of balance of a user. And on the top, you see the invariant itself, pretty simple, like only two lines of code, and this is how it looks in a rule. And also it can help you to understand what is an invariant. Invariant is simply the requirement that we defined, then uh, any function call, uh, parametric call, and then the same assertion. Uh, this is like how it looks like, but there are several violations. Um, we won't stop a lot about how to fix it because invariant is more like additional topic for this workshop, but I want also to show you the benefits of invariant in terms of the size and uh, com comfortability to use it. Because, for example, we want, uh, the first thing that we, um, we will see in that violation that, like in our assertion right now, we assume only balance of one user. And uh, the contract example will be like the total supply equal to balance of a user, but what about all other users? They also can transfer do something, and this is what happened. In uh, the contract example for the rules, uh, we add, uh, we change a little bit our, our, our invariant. Now we assume two invariants, but there still will be the violation and transfer because it's a parametric call. And uh, two, and e-message sender in transfer, they can be different from the addresses that we check. And this is what will, this is, will be the violation. In this case, we need a preserved block. It's just a set of requirements uh, that will be applied only for transfer. This is how it looks in, uh, in invariant. We need to make sure that the two equal to account uh, from our invariant and the message sender equal to our sender that the balance of we check. But if we try to write the same in a rule, it takes much more space, much more lines of code, not really comfortable. Of course, you can put this if block inside the rule, but then the readability will be awful. It's better to make a, as a separate function, but here we need to use again selector, define variables, uh, write, write some constraints, and then we need to, uh, to call the transfer. So you like, you, you, you write the transfer two times instead of one time here, for example. The, but it's, it, it doesn't mean that uh, if you define this function, it's always the bad thing. Uh, for, for example, it's good in, re, in reusability if you need to use this function in several uh, rules, like 
welcome to do it. It's a really good thing because you optimize the size of your code. And as I said, not all, not everything we can explain, express as an invariant. So, and this is, was an example uh, just only for transfer for all other functions uh, which had violations that kind of the same. The main point is just to show you another feature of CVL, how to just how to explain the properties and why it might be good to use it. For now, that's it. We covered many things. Uh, there are still more things to do, but they're more advanced and it's an advanced topic not of this workshop. We, we, we wrote the simple rules. We saw how it can be written. We talked about environment variables, methods block, and what does it mean uh, environment and then free. We considered reverting paths, parametric rules, how we can select methods in parametric rules. We talked a bit about the coverage, which is kind of a subjective thing. And, uh, and, uh, and the last feature was the invariance. Now I think the euro will take over to take about to talk about uh, the workshop, the practical part of it. Thank you. So we went into a lot of uh, CVL features, a lot of uh, theoretical stuff, and now let's try to do some uh, hands-on work. Yeah. So we're going to work on Open Zeppelin ZRC20 token contract in which we inserted some bugs, uh, really simple bugs. So if you look at the Solidity code, you will see the bugs immediately. They're not uh, super interesting. The interesting part is to try to find the bugs using formal verif verification. Uh, so the task will be to write a unit test rule, which verifies transfer in the parametric rule. And then there, there is a bonus task, which is uh, a bit more complicated parametric rule. Uh, yeah. So what we're gonna do? So first of all, uh, you should have the Docker desktop on your laptop, and uh, you should clone this uh, our tutorials uh, repository. So can be people people who participate in this exercise raise hands? Mm. Okay, so the, the people who will participate in the exercise, so uh, follow this step. So start the Docker desktop, then uh, clone the, the repo. And uh, wherever you run into some issues, so we have uh, uh, Sasha, Armin here, me, we will help you with, any, with anything. So clone the repo and just follow the steps in this, uh, on the slide. So again, people who follow the exercise, please raise your hand if you run into some uh, any issue. We we will we will help you. Uh, so yeah, this is the steps. You you clone the repo. In the, in the repo, there is like a files which is describes what what tasks to do. No 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 no. It's the, on the next. <laughs> sorry, there is also the next slide <laughs> that explains that. Um, you have to go to the CVL workshop folder and um, uh, and see the spec. Yeah, so this is this is the actual exercise. So we start with uh, people who follow, start with the Docker, clone the repo, open the, the correct uh, branch of the repo, switch, uh, check out the correct branch, and then you have to 
open this <coughs> open the docker uh, open uh, use the reopen container command in visual studio code with the remote containers extension this command will uh, ask you to download our uh, docker image and then from this docker image you do the exercise the name uh, so we're going to do a small change of plans because the internet here is a bit slow to download the docker file we're going to do some live coding demonstrations how we actually solve the exercise so it's going to be more uh, clear for you guys So our task is <coughs> um, yeah. Our first task is a first exercise is to write a unit test rule that test the transfer function, and uh, we basically need this. Uh, we need this assert to, to. We basically need to write a rule that at the end of, at the end of it. This assert will uh, will be checked, right? So how are we going to do that? So first of all, like, like you remember, we need to declare the environment, and since we do, since we test the transfer function, so we're just going to we're just going to call it. with some random recipient and amount. Now we also need to declare this recipient and amount. And we need to declare these variables, balance sender after and balance sender before. So balance sender before will be will be the balance of the message sender. So all these functions like balance off and transfer and others already declared in the methods block. There is no need to declare them again. And the balance sender after will be clearly the balance after the operation. And now the rule looks ready. So according to the instructions, we can execute it. Well, it says that we have some mistake here because we didn't declare the type of the variable. Usually it's the same uh, the same time.
So now we now after the rule compiles after a few iterations, now we execute it. And what does it mean to execute it? We ha we have a we have already a script. Uh, the script just runs the Sertora run command command uh, command uh, CLI tool, and we tell the Sertora run to verify the ERC20 uh, contract with the setup.spec. So like we mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we, to the Sertora prover, we have to give the smart contract code and the rules. So here, this is the smart contract code, and these are the rules. So what, hap what, what happens here is that there is some kind of static analysis happening locally, and then, uh, and then the tool sends everything to the cloud. Uh, so the, the, the main chunk of the tool runs in the cloud, just some small uh, local static analysis runs on the computer, and most of it runs uh, on AWS. And here we get some uh, command line outputs, and uh, eventually it will give us the link to the web page where we'll see the execution results. So now here we have a link to the status page and the verification report, which is the interesting part. So we're gonna click on that. And see that the transfer correctness function, which we written, which we've been writing right now, has uh, failed. So it's interesting to find out why it failed. And we open the call trace. Okay, so in the beginning the balance was two. And then we try to transfer 15 tokens, right? Which uh, is not supposed to work because uh, with the balance of two, we should not be able to transfer 15. But it still it still did not revert. Yeah, so there is some problem there because, uh, like we mentioned, the Sertora will only look at um, non-reverting pass. And normally, if the code is good and we try to uh, transfer 15 tokens from from balance of two, it, the code would would revert. <laughs> But here it did not revert. And now we look at balance sender after, and it's uh, become huge. So it's obviously an underflow here. Yeah. Uh, it's obviously an underflow. So this assertion is, doesn't hold, yeah, because now balance sender after is huge. It's almost max uint, and balance sender before was very small. So we see the, the, the problem, possible problem is with the uh, underflow. So now we can go look at the code. Wh why, what is this bug that we found? And it's a very, it's a very silly bug. So basically what we did is What we did is uh, we just say unchecked. We we do this uh, transfer unchecked. We don't we don't check that uh, the sender has enough has enough balance to send the tokens, and we do uh, unchecked uh, subtraction. So that's why we have this underflow underflow problem. Uh, and the point is that we found this bug not by not by looking at the code. We found this bug by writing a very simple rule. It's, we call it a unit test rule because it just checks one uh, one function, one uh, one particular scenario. And we already found the prover found found this uh, problematic uh, case for us. We just try to send too, too too many too many tokens, and the code doesn't check that the balance is sufficient. So that's why we have this problem. So this is this this is the exercise one. Mm. Make sense? Yeah. 
I think usually the code uh, should uh, should uh, checks if the balance is sufficient for the transfer. And I just I think I just remove this check. The like we require that the the balance is greater or equal to the amount. But w when there is no check, it just uh, says okay, we have enough tokens, so let's go. Now for exercise two, we want to write a parametric rule that verifies uh, fixed total supply. So like we, we assume that we work with the token that has fixed total supply. And uh, we want to write a rule that says no function call ever can change total supply. This is a bit more interesting rule. So how are we gonna do that? So this is, the, this is, this is our final assert. Yeah? So again, we do uh, environment, uh, method, we'll, method method as we already have. Let's do call data arcs for the F invocation. Let's get the total supply before. Total before. This total supply function is already defined, declared here in the methods block. It just access to the public variable. And now uh, the magic part is calling the calling any function with any arguments. And again, we will take the total total uh, total supply after the operation. And this is a rule. Oh, that's a very good. That's a very good question, but this this would require much more uh, much more uh, rule writing than we can do now. Basically, for this we would need to uh, track locally how the, if the total supply variable is updated correctly. For this we would uh, use a local state in CVL which we call ghosts, ghost variable. Basically, like we would have a CVL variable which tracks the solidity variable. It it requires a bit of. Uh, Yeah, you're right. For if you, if you want to really work verify everything, we need to prove that the total supply variable is updated correctly. After we prove that, we can already use this proof and use the total supply variable and assume that it's it's all it, it's true. It's good.
now when it finished checking, we, we, we see that the total supply is fixed rule also failed. And it failed on a few different functions, on approve, on transfer from, on increase allowance, decrease allowance. So let's, let's see the first one, why it failed on approve. So when we ran approve, the total supply was 15. Then we executed this generic function f, which in this particular case was approve. And then we see that the total supply changed. It became 17. So something happened in the, in, inside the approve function. And if we, if we drill down the call trace into the deep inside the proof, we see that for some reason something changed in total supply. So this call trace gives us a place to look in the code. It, it tells us to look at uh, function underscore proof. Maybe something, something wrong is going on there. So let's check this function in, in the solidity code. So it, 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 we, we can see immediately that the total supply has just increased the proof, just increase uh, the total supply by the amount ask, asked uh, to approve. Yeah, so it's a very silly, silly code. Again, the idea is to show how, the, uh, how, the, how we can find the bug not by looking at the code, but by writing a very generic rule that the total supply should not, should not change. And immediately we see that the approve function does something uh, something suspicious. It changes the total supply for some reason. And obviously the increase allowance, decrease allowance, and transfer from, they also call this underscore approve. So it's all the same, the same bug. And we found the, uh, and we found the problem in the code just by uh, writing a very short, very concise uh, parametric rule that says check total supply, Call, call, do any operation, check total supply again, and make sure they're equal. Uh, so this was the second task. Mm. Questions? And now let's do the third, third exercise, which is the can transfer balance. Basically, it's a rule that says that any user can transfer their entire balance out. Sorry? Yeah. I require that, but uh, you, you can do your way as well.
So now we we did this uh, transfer with reward, which you discussed in the presentation. It requires a lot of uh, preconditions to make sure that we don't get rewards on things that uh, don't interest don't interest us. All this stuff. We don't care that the, if the message sender is zero, the recipient is zero, stuff like that. So now it's now the execution, uh, the verification uh, co completed, and we can go to the report and uh, look at this and transfer balance rule. Mm. 
nächste Mal das Video konzentrieren. So, und das war jetzt das Video von Sport und Fortuna. Das war gut, das dritte Punkt. Ja, ich hoffe, du bist sicher, aber ja, ich glaube, das ist ein sehr schwieriges Wort. Ja. Aber ja, ich bin da bis zu dem Zeitpunkt, ob ich mir das hätte, ob das wichtig ist, ja. dass das Wort drin ist. Ich war noch beschäftigt mit dem Sport, ich hatte so viel auf die Zeit, um mir alles mal noch zu wissen. Ich schaue jetzt mal auf die Telefonate. Das muss es sein, okay. Und da ist das die Kommentierung, ich habe keine Ahnung, ob das Wort nicht drin ist. Ich hoffe, das ist ein Podcast, weil ich denke, da muss es sein. Da, deswegen muss ich dich dann in der Zeitung fragen, dass ich keine Ahnung habe. Ja, das ist jetzt mal wichtig. Ja, das passt. Und bei Juni, was haben wir noch mit dem Spieler versehen? Ah, mit Twitter muss ich reden. Das, was haben wir noch versehen? Und wir sind im Interview, im Interview, aber das ist wie gesagt bei Juni. Du musst es reden. Ja, ich muss es reden. Ja. Ein bis drei. So our final task was, our final exercise was to write the rules that verifies <laughs> how a user can transfer the entire balance out. And what we did, we uh, added all these requires for all, all these preconditions uh, that uh, for cases that don't interest us, so we don't fail on message center zero, or recipient zero, or message value greater than zero. So we filter all the things that are, uh, are not important. And then we just call transfer with revert and assert that there was no revert because all the conditions are correct for, for a transfer. But we, st we still see that uh, the function failed, the function reverted. And when we drill down the call trace, uh, we see that uh, there is a line, something about whitelist in, in the smart contract code line 279. So we will go to the smart contract to the line 279. 
And we see that the transfer function in this token, it requires the sender to be whitelisted. So only whitelisted addresses can transfer. That's why we got a revert, because actually this is like an example for a malicious token that doesn't let, doesn't let, uh, um, that doesn't let addresses transfer tokens out unless they're whitelisted. So there used to be like uh, rug pull tokens like this uh, maybe a couple of years ago. You can buy this token, but you can never uh, transfer it out. You can never sell it. So this is another example that there is like a, this is not even a bug, this is kind of an example for a malicious code. And we can easily detect it with a simple rule that uh, tests that uh, users just can transfer their balance out, right? And the prover immediately finds a counterexample. Any address like here, 401, it's not whitelisted, so it cannot transfer the tokens out. So th this concludes this concludes uh, this concludes the uh, the hands-on exercise, which un unfortunately too difficult to do without uh, uh, with slow Wi-Fi and without installing all this uh, uh, Docker uh, our Docker image. But uh, you you can see how how it's possible to write this how to possible how it's possible to write the rules on the faulty ERC twenty token and detect all the three bugs which were inserted into it by the rules which are uh, quite quite simple. Uh, this is it. <laughs>